And so we come to the fourth bill to be considered this morning. Community and suspended sentences, notification of details bill, second reading. Now. Ruth Jones. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I beg to move that the bill be now read a second time. And I am delighted to rise to bring this bill to the House today. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is a very important but focused bill, and it will amend the Sentencing Code 2020 to create a duty on offenders to notify the responsible officer of any change of name or contact details if they are sentenced to a community order, a suspended su sentence order, a youth rehabilitation order, or a referral order. This bill will place a new duty on offenders serving a sentence in the community and who are being supervised by the probation service or a youth offending team to ensure that any name or contact details change is notified to the relevant responsible officer. And this bill captures not just any formal legal changes of a name, but also, for example, the use of an online alias. Offenders will need to notify their responsible officer of any change as soon as practicable. My bill will apply to adults and child offenders alike so that we can create some form of consistency across all offenders who are on licence and, importantly, it will extend to offenders serving community sentences. In 2022, secondary legislation was passed requiring offenders on licence to inform their probation officer if they change their name or contact details. This bill will help to ensure consistency across the sentencing framework to ensure offenders serving community sentences have their risks managed effectively. For those offenders who are serving community orders, youth rehabilitation orders and referral orders, the requirements contained in the bill will last the whole duration of the order, whilst the offender remains supervised by probation or their youth offending team until it reaches the end date set by the court or is otherwise terminated. For suspended sentence orders, this requirement will last for the period when the offender must keep in touch with probation. Once the offender is no longer required to keep in touch with probation or the youth offending team, this requirement will also end. Failure to comply with the duty will be the same as failure to comply with the requirement of the order. An offender could be taken back to court. When an order is returned to court, then the court could make the requirements of the order more onerous impose a fine or even sentence the individual to custody. The management of offenders in the community is of the utmost importance to ensure that the people in Newport West in my constituency and across the United Kingdom are protected and of course to reduce re-offending. It is vital that probation and youth offending teams have the information required to be able to effectively manage offenders in the community and the ability to take swift enforcement action where needed. This bill will improve the ability of probation and youth offending teams to monitor offenders, helping to ensure that the public are protected by ensuring that while an offender is serving a sentence in the community, the responsible officer has the information they need to keep an eye on that individual. And as I've already noted, this requirement already applies to offenders released from custody. And so I believe that it is important to ensure that the same requirement applies to offenders serving sentences in our community. And Madam Deputy Speaker, as co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Safeguarding in Religious Communities, I've heard some harrowing accounts of, of offenders who have changed their name quite legitimately at present by deed poll, uh, but have then gone on to commit harrowing offences again and again. This is not acceptable. The people of Newport West elected me to this place in April 2019, and since then I've sat through many a Friday sitting, listening to detailed and on occasion lengthy second reading opening remarks. So in the hope of speedily getting this bill through to the next stage of its journey in this House, and of hopefully, hopefully colleagues from all sides giving it their support, I will bring my remarks to a close shortly. In supporting this bill, this House has an opportunity to improve the ability of probation and youth offending teams to monitor and support offenders in the community as effectively as possible. And, it is, and importantly for me, uh, most importantly, Madam Deputy Speaker, it allows us all to better protect the people who sent us here, the British people. Keeping our people safe from Newport West to North Down and from Newcastle Central to North Devon is our most important responsibility as Members of Parliament. 
and with that in mind, I urge colleagues across the House to give this bill their full support today. Thank you. Yeah. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Chris Clarkson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I'm very pleased to be supporting the Honourable Lady's Bill. Um, I'm, I'm what would be t uh, typically referred to as a Tory wet, which means that I don't <laughs> think that locking up everybody is always going to be the panacea for everything. And I do think community uh, sentences have an important role to play. Not only do we have a particularly crowded prison estate as it is, um, I don't actually think that the rehabilitation of offenders who very often get shorter sentences because their crimes may be their first instance or actually relatively minor um, are best placed to be rehabilitated whilst in the prison estate. I mean, look, if it's a problem of a lag or a villain, then lock them up for 20 years. But, you know, fundamentally, we should be trying to get people into the habit of, uh, of improving their lives. We should be creating productive citizens. And so I do support these measures uh, very much, but I do think the Honourable Lady has alighted on a very important point here. If somebody leaves the custodial, um, uh, leaves a custodial sentence, there are rules and regulations in place to make sure that they are not changing their identity or somehow getting around the system in order to, as she quite uh, correctly pointed out, re-offend. And there will be some people who will go on to re-offend. The truth of the matter is there will also sadly be some people who will go on to re-offend after having uh, one of these non-custodial sentences. And so by applying the same regime that applies to people who have been in the prison estate, we're not introducing a new special punishment for these people. They're not receiving any kind of extra burden. What they're being asked to do is comply with a perfectly sensible regime. So I, I extremely welcome uh, what the Honourable Lady has done here. I think we all will know of at least one or two heartbreaking cases from our own constituency where the system hasn't quite worked as it should do. Um, I think back to when I first started here, I was uh, met by the family of a constituent who was uh, actually murdered by somebody who was out on parole. Um, and a similar issue had taken place with identity. Uh, documents had been lost, meetings were not taking place. This man had basically just disappeared into the ether of the system. Had there been this sort of safeguard in place, I can't guarantee it would have saved this other, uh, this other person's life, but it certainly would have made it much, much less li uh, likely that a little boy was left without his dad and parents were left without their son. So um, in bringing my own uh, brief remarks to a close, I just want to congratulate the Honourable Lady for bringing this and I look forward to supporting it. Sherilyn McCrory. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I also thank the member for Newport West for bringing this uh, very important uh, legislation here today, and I congratulate her on bringing it to second reading. Uh, the constituents in Truro and Falmouth, my constituents, care and want above all else to live in a safe and hospitable community, and the way we deal with those that break that safety or break our laws and disrupt our towns and villages uh, is incredibly important to them. It's one of the most important things that they can uh, uh, they, they need to feel safe and it's one of the most important issues that comes up time and again uh, when I'm out and about and talking to my communities. But not everybody that, could, that um, commits a crime is, uh, is um, you know, considered dangerous and therefore I'm pleased we have levels of uh, punishments that are appropriate to each one. Um, before I go on to what this might mean to the people in Truro and Falmouth and Cornwall beyond, um, I just wanted to say a little bit on uh, women prisoners and uh, women offenders and why this will be so important, uh, such an important thing there. In Cornwall, uh, the nearest women's prison is HMP Eastwood Park, which is in southwest Gloucestershire. And for those of you that are not from the southwest, that probably sounds incredibly close. In actual fact, it's nearly 200 miles away from Cornwall. So if you're a, a, a low level woman offender and you happen to have a, a small baby or a small child or you're pregnant, you're going to move 200 miles away potentially from your, from, your, uh, uh, from your children. And therefore, courts understand that these days and they understand they want to keep uh, women who are not a danger to society nearer their families. And therefore, levelling up uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the submitting of names and contact details as they would if they were in prison is another safeguard that courts, you know, courts will have in their back pocket to know that if somebody they want to give low-level sentences to, but actually they need to keep track of them for whatever reason, uh, that is there. Maternity imprisonment, for example, impacts an average of 17,000 children each year. And by keeping criminals as, with a sentence of less than 12 months in the community, we are able to prevent hundreds of children from being brought into our prisons and growing up in those unsuitable in, in, un, un, and unstable environments. It's much better for children across the South West to live in their communities and grow up with a parent that is clearly giving back to the community, albeit through an imposed sentence. 
And by making clear com connections between crime and the community and the locals that are impacted, there'll always be a greater awareness of the in individual and, for, because of their children, the impact of the crime. And therefore, it's no coincidence, Madam Deputy Speaker, that it's, um, our Police and Crime Commissioner, Alison Hernandez, is leading the charge in Devon and Cornwall uh, with the combined treatment orders, for example, that directly deal with men mental health issues, alcoholism and drug addiction for those with community sentencing, keeping people unnecessarily out of toxic prison environments where these flaws are likely to be exploited and made unmanageable, instead supporting the criminal in the community with regular treatment programmes and support. Tackling these factors is essential to reducing reoffending rates and repair the roots of addiction that may have helped people get into that position in the first place where law, where law breaking became an option. Helping to rebuild lives is the best way of ensuring that they continue to feed back to their local community. And the South West was the first region to secure funding for enabling mental health treatment requirements as part of a community order. This is because we work as a team in the South West, again led by the work of Alison Hernandez, and the Plymouth team in, in, in particular is a team that's been held up as good practice as part of the original pilot schemes to the rest of the country. Uh, community payback has an opportunity to expand, hopefully under the immediate justice funding coming to, uh, coming to Devon and Cornwall later this year, of around half a million pounds. Um, and as our police and crime commissioner is determined to get offenders filling potholes, and again working in the region, we think this is rewarding work and builds um, a precedent achieved in Devon where it has been done by volunteers. And if people think this is, doesn't matter to, to, to life, there are other issues where these orders are seen as uh, important to the local community. In Cornwall, everybody knows everybody, and if you're seen having to pay back to your local community, there's a, there's a slight issue there of you know, peer pressure and uh, you know, what are you doing, and people don't really want to be seen doing that. So it is actually being used as a deterrent, which is different from cities where people don't really know each other in their locality as much. And to give you a few examples, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I looked on the, uh, on the St Agnes Parish Council, one of my very proactive parish councils in the north coast of my constituency, and they really have been taking advantage of community payback schemes to the local community. People have been uh, uh, sweeping the library building, litter picking, um, looking at we weeding and head cutting around the library car parks and on the verges. They've been painting benches. They've been cutting the ivy back across parish council-owned buildings, cleaning notice boards and bus stops, pressure washing where needs to be having to, to stop slippery pavements, painting toilet blocks, uh, painting the lich gate of the Garden of Rest, um, grass cutting, painting play equipment for Beaconsfield Play Park, uh, implementing the installation of water pipes and uh, you know, uh, m maintaining the allotment site up at Mount Hawk. These are really useful jobs and when parish councils are strapped for cash, I just think this is fabulously in innovative. You've got local people who have fallen foul of the law but aren't a danger to society doing something absolutely um, uh, brilliant for the local community. And what my, the Honourable Lady's uh, private member's bill will do today um, is to just, to, as I said earlier, level up the, so that they are still recognised as being under a, uh, under a sentence, albeit not a custodial one. And I, I wanted to just raise with the Minister, because I wasn't sure how this would affect, um, but I, hopefully it's going to help um, those that come under Clare's law. So if somebody is convicted of domestic violence, but again, not seen as a, uh, not seen as a danger to the rest of society, often, and it, you know, is quite frustrating for me and others in my position, but they're often not given a custodial sentence. And under Clare's law, they have to be on a register, but sometimes, as we know, they want to go and change their identity and move to another part of the country or another part of their locality. And I just wonder whether this new private members bill will actually um, help to strengthen Clare's law for those that sometimes might otherwise fall through the cracks. Thank you. Duncan Baker. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is a really useful little bill. It's hard to argue with any of this at all. So I'm very grateful to the Honourable Member for Newport West for, for bringing it into the House today. And, I, and when I was reading about the bill, um, I immediately thought of a, a case that I had uh, a couple of years ago when I was an MP, I was still an MP, but thought to myself how this had um, some resonance with, with, with some of the, the, the bill that you've brought about today. And uh, it originated from receiving an email from an individual where the name that came up on my computer was different to the email address, which was then different to the name on the email when it was signed off. 
And let's just say that the email in question was not necessarily totally sympathetic to what I thought was the fine work I was doing in North Norfolk. <laughs> but um, as a sort of fairly nice chap, as I consider myself to be, I wrote back to this individual and said, of course I will, I will meet with you. And very pertinent, obviously, at the moment with MP security, um, I did my own little bit of research to try and discover out of the three different names I was given who this individual was. I don't want to give too much away, obviously, because it will reveal that person's identity. But I did find who that individual was, and uh, they had served a prison sentence for a crime. Uh, they were now out. Uh, I shan't go into that crime, obviously, but immediately that gave me some alarm bells, and I contacted the police. I did say I would have a surgery, but please, could the police just be present? But I thought, when reading about the bill, I thought this is very, very pertinent to people that are on community centres and just how it weaves into the, the, the whole bill that we mentioned today, because there are individuals out there trying to contact public officials who are quite clearly hiding under an alias and trying to be anonymous in effectively in, in trying to meet with us and others as well. So a really, really good uh, bill. And, and it's, it's ironic, isn't it? Because in today's life, when everything we do is tracked, I mean, you know, from a smartwatch to a mobile phone to your Alexa, other brands are obviously out there, um, it seems incredible that people can not be found. But of course, if you are using an alias and trying to not be detected, these things can clearly happen. And one of the reasons I thought that this bill was so important was because it, it also reminded me of uh, my experience um, with having friends who are in the probation service. And so certainly one of the comments which I would ask the, the minister when he makes his remarks at the dispatch box to pick up on is just can the probation service cope with the additional workload that will be required with this bill. Now, um, tomorrow is the second year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, a year ago, I went to uh, Ukraine taking generators there. And uh, it takes about nine hours of solid driving to get from North Norfolk all the way across to Ukraine. And uh, sitting in a... You, you get to know your, your cabmates pretty well of driving a transit van that far. And I was sitting with a friend who was a probation officer. And um, after sort of probably every other possible co conversation, many between two blokes that can't be repeated in the house today, as you can imagine, uh, had been exhausted for hours and hours on end, uh, you know, we started to talk about, you know, his life in the probation service. And it gave me a real idea of just how tough a role and how important a role that is uh, indeed. So a really... And, and of course... In my previous career, um, I'll openly admit, as an accountant, uh, I have absolutely no idea about the criminal justice system until I became an MP, right? And, and possibly why would I? And so the comments that um, the Honourable Member for Hayward and Middleton made when, when he was speaking about being a Tory wet, I thought was really interesting because it, it said to me, actually, uh, I'm probably a bit of a Tory wet, but I didn't realise I was. Because before I was an MP, I certainly wasn't. But actually now, from learning about the criminal justice system, I think you have a far more, far more awareness to just what those hard-working men and women do in our prison service. They are quite phenomenal with the roles that they carry out. So from that small conversation, travelling to Ukraine a year ago, talking to my friend about the probation service, to understanding far more about the criminal justice system today, uh, I have a far greater awareness and understanding, really, of the respect I have for those men and women. And the first trip I took this year, 3rd of January, when we were on recess, was to go and visit uh, HMP Bure, which is a Category C uh, men's uh, prison in my constituency, right on the border. It's home to 643 uh, prisoners, uh, and it is run by Governor Roden and hit the fine men and women that uh, run that prison. And I think all of these strands of what I've talked about today were conceptualised when I went on that visit because I then realised just how tough a job it was. Um, 
and actually how rehabilitation is so important because I was completely unaware, really, of just what those men and women do behind the scenes. Um, but indeed, not only are they incredibly hard-working and decent people, but you also get to see what it's like just for a few hours in prison life and what prisoners do and their rehabilitation. And so to see prisoners on bicycle mechanic courses, art courses, uh, welding courses, preparing them for life when they uh, are back uh, out of prison, giving them a skill set to be able to, to find employment, was probably something I rather admit I had not taken into account at all. And so as I sort of begin to, to uh, wind up my remarks, you know, I want to first of all place on record again, and I've said it a few times, just to the hard men, the hard working men and women at HMP Bure. They are not, I don't think, in society respected enough for the work that they do. Uh, they are not paid enough, actually, for the hard work that they do, and the conditions are not always, not always good. Um, and one of their, their biggest concerns is their retirement age. And I know there's quite a campaign around the 68 uh, years old. And so whether the minister can, can make a comment about that on his winding up. But, you know, is it in the public's interest, is it fair in society that uh, police officers are retiring at one age and prison officers are at a completely different age, which is much older, at 68 for new intakes? These people are on their, their feet all day long. They are often putting themselves at really quite high levels of risk. And I think actually in a civilised society we need to look at that date. Uh, and I think actually it's important that we really do place on record that... Friend, Certainly. Um, I thank my friend for giving way. First of all, I'm astounded to think, say that it only takes nine hours to get from Norfolk to uh, Ukraine when actually it takes five hours to get from... Uh, Westminster to Cornwall, but there we are, that's a different matter. Um, but I would, agree, I would agree with all the points he was making on the prison officers, by the way, and um, to uh, ask somebody who needs to use their physical strength, actually, in their job to work until they're 68 is often quite a big ask. Do you agree with me on that point? I, I do agree with you, uh, uh, with Honourable Member, for that, and, and that's why I'm making the point. I think, actually, this needs to be looked at properly and it needs to be put in more context, perhaps, with similar roles in society, such as police officers, and that's why I make the point. Uh, it's nine hours a day driving. Um, it's nine hours for about uh, two and a half days. Uh, yes, through, my apologies if I didn't make that clear, through uh, Holland, <laughs> Germany. <laughs> yes, it's a, lo it's a long way, put it like that, yeah. Uh, so look, I will wind up there, and, uh, but thank again the Honourable Member for Newport West. We're very, very uh, interesting bill and one that feels like complete common sense and I hope is supported. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Shadow Minister Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'm back again, this time back on the front bench uh, for the uh, third uh, outing today, so I apologise for my ubiquity, but it is a pleasure to support um, this bill being presented by my very good friend, the Honourable Member for Newport West, and I congratulate you on her success in the private member's ballot. And really is a great day for the Welsh. This will be the third, by the sound of it, with the support I've heard across the House, bill from a Welsh a Member of Parliament, a Welsh Labour Member of Parliament, to be, uh, receive its second reading today. And for those who say that, uh, you know, with devolution, that you know, MPs from the devolved nations don't play a role in this place, there's the proof for you right here in the uh, fact that three bills have re reached this stage today. And I do thank everyone across the House on a serious point for their support for our bills and it's a pleasure from the front bench to support the bill from my honourable friend and also thank those members who contributed to the debate, the, the honourable lady from uh, Truro and Falmouth, uh, the honourable gentleman from Maywood and Middleton, who's also on his feet a lot today, uh, and the honourable member from North Norfolk, who I never would have guessed was an accountant in a previous life, which he revealed during the course of the, uh, the debate today. Um, but um, he really spoke, I thought, he really spoke with a lot of compassion, actually, and a lot of sense in his contribution to the debate. Uh, and he did mention probation. That's one point I wanted to make, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, in my brief remarks, and that is that it was actually 20 years ago that, uh, that the Labour government introduced, and I was here, 
community orders and suspended sentence orders in their current form designed to be robust alternatives to prison in cases of less serious offending, but it's been disappointing since then to note that the use of community sentences has, has declined sharply, particularly in the last decade, particularly in 2012 and 2022. In 2017, a survey of, survey of magistrates found that over a third were not confident that community sentences were an effective alternative to custody, and two-thirds were not confident that they cut crime. So it's plain to see that more must be done to strengthen the confidence in both of both the courts and the public um, that sentences served in the community are effective, appropriate and, above all, safe. And this, that's particularly pressing given the government's proposals in the sentencing bill, which we're awaiting it to return for its committee stage on the floor of the House, Madam Deputy Speaker, hopefully soon, which will see a new presumption that all sentences of less than a year should be suspended unless there are exceptional circumstances, such as a breach of pre a previous order or risk to a particular individual. Now, the measures in this bill will make an important contribution to that effort. In that, they will require offenders serving community or suspended sentences to alert their probation officer or youth offending team if they change their name or their contact details. But the question is how these necessary changes will be properly enforced whilst this government continues to load more and more pressure onto the probation service without any additional resource. Sentences served in the community can only be effective if there is a functioning probation service which is rooted in the local area and able to enforce sentences and keep offenders on the right track. So I'm sure the Minister can see that our probation service today is already critically understaffed, undervalued and overstretched. Probation workloads are soaring. Almost 50,000 working days among probation staff have been lost due to stress, with 68% of probation officers rating their caseload as unmanageable. And more and more experienced prison officers which were also mentioned, are leaving the service and there's over a thousand vacancies for probation staff. A recent watchdog report warned that such understaffing is having a devastating effect on delivering the good outcomes that I think this bill is intended to support. Uh, in September, the annual report of Her Majesty's Inspector of Probation said that of the 31 inspections of probation delivery units completed since the probation service was reunified uh, uh, in 2021, only one was found to be good. The rest were rated either as requires improvement or inadequate. So, whilst I thank my friend, the Honourable Member for Newport West for bringing this bill forward and urge all members to support the measures in this bill as a necessary step forward, I do challenge the Government to ensure that the probation service is given the resources it needs to ensure these reforms are successful and the public remain protected as they and the courts expect and I call on the Government to affirm their commitment to enforcing the crucial measures set out in this Bill uh, uh, when it becomes law. Minister Mike Freer. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, first of all, uh, may I thank the Honourable Member from Newport West for bringing forward this Bill, and I'm grateful for uh, the, also for the support from the uh, Opposition. Um, and I will address some of the comments he's made, although I don't necessarily agree with the characterisation of the probation service. But let me turn, start off by turning to uh, the, the main thrust of the bill, because the bill will place a new duty on offenders serving a sentence in the community and who are being supervised by probation or a youth offending team, requiring them to inform the responsible officer if they begin using a different name or change their contact information, including telephone or email. While we have a separate youth justice system, it is of equal, if not greater, importance that youth offending teams are able to keep tabs on their children and have the right information about them to do their jobs. We welcome the fact that this policy applies equally to offenders of all ages and will create consistency across offenders on licence and offenders serving sentences in the community, overseen by probation services or youth offending teams. The offender will be required to comply with this requirement whilst their order is in effect and has not been revoked or discharged. For suspended sentence orders, this requirement will last for the period when the offender must keep in touch with probation. For offenders serving community orders, youth rehabilitation orders and referral orders, the requirement will last for the whole duration of the order while the offender is supervised by probation or their youth offending team until it reaches the end date set by the court or is otherwise terminated. 
Sentencing in individual cases, of course, is a matter for our independent judiciary, and the courts have a broad range of sentencing powers to deal effectively and appropriately with offenders, including discharges, fines, community sentences, suspended sentences, as well as imprisonment. This government is clear that delivering public protection means imposing custodial sentences when the offence is so serious that custody is justified. It is worth noting, however, that even when that threshold is met, the court should consider whether a community sentence would be more suitable in that particular case. And as my honourable friend from Truro and Falmouth commented uh, with regard to uh, some of the challenges on the women estate and the distances, then clearly that can be a factor that the judiciary can take into account. And uh, my honourable friend also raised the issue of Clare's Law. My understanding is that it does cover it, but I will double check so that I will not misled her or the House uh, and write to her and also place a copy of that letter in the House of Commons Library. In many cases, Madam Deputy Speaker, there is a persuasive evidence that suspended and community sentences can be more effective than short custodial sentences in reducing reoffending and rehabilitation. Sorry, and rehabilitation. More than half of people given a custodial sentence of less than 12 months reoffend within a year. For offenders punished with suspended sentence orders with requirements that are served in the community, the reoffending rate is much lower. And I think that was a point my honourable friend for Haywood and Middleton uh, made uh, that sometimes prison doesn't work. In fact, it can make things worse. And our sentencing framework gives courts the flexibility to choose and balance a range of community based requirements, such as unpaid work, drug and alcohol treatment, curfew, and electronic monitoring, with the intention of punishing the offender, providing reparation to the community, and addressing any uh, cr criminogenic or rehabilitative that's a new word on me criminogenic or rehabilitative needs uh, of the offender, which may otherwise increase the likelihood of their reoffending. We know that rigorous community offender management is vital to build confidence in these orders and deliver effective rehabilitation while keeping the public safe. Um, the uh, Shadow Minister uh, mentioned the uh, probation service. I can reassure him that we are committed and we share that commitment to ensure that the probation service uh, is effective, is funded appropriately, and we do value their work. And that's why we are investing an additional £155 million a year in the probation service to recruit record levels of staff and up to £93 million in community payback uh, as a way of complementing that. And in fact, if I may, Madam Deputy Speaker, just to also reassure my honourable friend from North Norfolk who raised uh, these same points that um, in the year to uh, end of uh, December 2023, uh, banned four probation officers, the recruitment numbers were up 6.3% on the previous year, and in banned three probation officers, it was up 2.1% on previous years. So we are confident that our probation services uh, can deal with this issue. I must also point out, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the actual duty is on the offender not on the probation service. And if I draw uh, colleagues' attention to the actual bill itself, just looking through the bill, if you just look at, say, uh, section one, duty of offender, duty of offender, page two, duty of offender, duty of offender. Throughout the bill, Madam Deputy Speaker, duty of offender is loud and clear. It is their responsibility to comply, and if they don't comply, then they will have to bear the consequences. Now, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, as well as the investment in the probation service, of course, we are also investing as a government. Um, uh, 532 million has been invested through the Department of Health and Social Care to increase substance misuse treatment provision in all local authorities in England. Um, of course, that would be devolved, I think, in Wales. Um, and having recruited dedicated criminal justice staff to increase the quality of treatment and assessment delivery, we do believe this is a, an approach which dovetails on ensuring that uh, those community sentences also support those people with other issues. And the effectiveness of community sentences also relies uh, on the uh, probation and youth offending teams having the ability to manage offenders in the community successfully, and that means having the right information about them. Uh, we agree that this bill helps strengthen the means that probation and youth offending team services have at their disposal to monitor offenders, but I do reiterate, as I have a minute or so ago, the duty rests with the offender. And this, bill, bill, this bill builds on secondary legislation passed in 2022, requiring, requiring offenders on licence to inform their probation officer if they change their name or contact details. 
Um, we welcome the bill from the Honourable Lady and we will continue to do all we can to assist its passage. In my view, these provisions are robust uh, and whilst the name or contact details uh, change could be for valid reasons, they do require any difference from what is being kept on file to be reported. It captures not just formal legal changes of name by depot, but also, for example, the use of an online alias, another issue my honourable friend for North Norfolk uh, re reiterated. Um, as I've set out, Madam Deputy Speaker, we recognise the importance of ensuring that the public is protected, that rehabilitation can be effective, and that there is confidence in non-custodial sentences. That means ensuring offenders managed in the community are being properly monitored by probation with the ability for services to take robust enforcement action where necessary. We agree that this bill will, we agree that this bill will um, ensure that our uh, probation and youth offending teams will undertake that monitoring effectively by ensuring that while an offender is serving a sentence in the community, the responsible officer has the information that they need to keep tabs on that individual. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I just want to end by uh, again congratulating the Honourable Member for Newport West for bringing this bill before the House. I'm grateful to the official opposition for their support of the bill and also would like to place on thanks the officials at the Ministry of Justice for assisting the Honourable Lady in helping drafting this bill. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. With the leave of the House, Ruth Jones. Yay. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And with the leave of the House, I rise to close this debate. And let me start by thanking everybody taking part today in the atmosphere of cooperation and consensual politics that we've heard. It's, it's very different to what happened earlier on this week. So let me start by thanking the Honourable Member for Haywood and Middleton, because uh, like him, I agree that you know, lock em up philosophy isn't always the way forward and community sentences are a vital part of our punishment options and I agree with him there. Um, I was recently fortunate enough to go to Cardiff Prison with the Welsh Fair Select Committee and we saw uh, for ourselves um, prisoners who may be in for just seven days and seven days is not long enough to do anything useful in terms of rehab or, or making sure that we break the cycle. So it's really important the points he's, he's mentioned there. And I thank the Honourable Member for Truro and Falmouth um, about the, the, her most important points about female offenders and the distances. Um, like her in Wales, we don't, we don't have a single a, a female prison for, for women in Wales. Not that I'm saying we should have them, but, but I'm just accepting that they have a long way to travel, like her, her constituents. Um, and it means that women being apart from their families, it's disruptive, it's very costly to visit, it, and she made the points very, very importantly there. Um, and if anyone's in any doubt about female prisoners, they should watch maybe the Time series with Jodie Whittaker in it. It's a very yeah. powerful, powerful series. The Honourable Member for North Norfolk made an important, important point about aliases and social media. And, and like him, I'm sure we've all had uh, issues with people who've had different names on emails and, and they've turned up on different, different names. And it is, it is a concern, and, and I do share his concerns there, absolutely. Uh, but he also highlighted how important staff working in the criminal justice system are. And I too pay tribute and thank them for all their yeah. efforts. And I want to say thank you to the Shadow Minister for Cardiff West, and I do hope he can put his feet up on the plane to Dublin after this, because he's been very, very busy today. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's thanks to the Minister as well, and to, to the team in the department, um, and how he highlighted that the responsibility for notifying the change of details is on the offender, and, and he's quite right there. It's very important that we know that. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd also like to pay Thanks to, uh, to the WHIPS, the Public Bill Office, and to Adam Jogi in my office, um, because this week has seen our Parliament, the mother of all Parliaments, um, at, a, at a low point. But I do wish the media could be here to see and feel the atmosphere today, because I'm not a fan of adversarial politics, and consensual politics, I believe, is the way forward. And this has happened today, and I thank the House. Yeah. And I thank the Honourable Lady for her words. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As may as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Credit to titles, female succession bills.